Jason tried the doorknob and found that the house was unlocked. Worried, we went inside and found all three boys lying on the floor in the living room. There were all kinds of empty beer bottles and even an empty liquor bottle lying next to them. Both Nolan and William looked extremely pale, and when I checked them, they had no pulse. Jason went over to Craig and said that he had one, but that he could barely feel it. Hi there, my name is Emily, and I live in a quiet suburb where everyone knows each other. Or at least I thought that we all knew each other. Things have become very strained and chaotic lately, and I'm not really sure if my husband and I made the right choices. Maybe after you hear my story, you could let me know if you would have done anything differently. You see, it all started a few years ago. My husband Jason and I had two sons, Nolan and William, and they were 12 and 10 years old at the time when one of our neighbors, Scott, asked us if Nolan would be interested in joining the local baseball team that he coached. We knew that Nolan loved to play sports and so we eagerly signed him up. It didn't hurt that Scott had a son that was Nolan's age named Craig, and we figured that it would be a great way for Nolan to make a new friend, especially one that lived only a few houses away from our own. All summer, the boys would hang out with one another and would go to practice and games together. Nolan would get rides from Craig's father to their practices and games, which was really nice of him. Of course, we still attended Nolan's games and cheered him on when he was at bat or if he made an important play. However, all of this joy would quickly fade. In the fall, the boys went to school and baseball ended for the year. However, Nolan and Craig remained good friends and continued to hang out with one another until a week before Halloween. Nolan mentioned that he was going over to Craig's house to talk with him about what they were going to wear for Halloween, but that he would be back in time for dinner. William asked if he could go too, and Nolan said that it would be okay, and so the two of them left. As Jason and I were putting the final touches on dinner, I called Nolan's cell phone, but got no answer. After a few more attempts, I began to get worried, and so Jason and I went over to see why our sons weren't answering their phones. When we got to Craig's home, all the lights were off, and no one was answering the door. Angrily, Jason tried the doorknob and found that the house was unlocked. Worried, we went inside and found all three boys lying on the floor in the living room. There were all kinds of empty beer bottles and even an empty liquor bottle lying next to them. Both Nolan and William looked extremely pale, and when I checked them, they had no pulse. Jason went over to Craig and said that he had one, but that he could barely feel it. In a state of panic, we quickly called 911 and begged them to send help as soon as possible. The rest of the night was a complete blur as paramedics arrived and tried to save the lives of all three boys. Unfortunately, Nolan and William were pronounced dead when the paramedics arrived as they had no vital signs for far too long and Craig passed away while on his way to the hospital. Somehow, all three boys had passed away from alcohol poisoning. We were beyond stricken with grief and we demanded to know how this could have happened to our children. I tried to contact Scott and his wife but could never get through. We just assumed that they were just as heartbroken as we were and didn't want to speak to anyone until we spoke to their next door neighbor. I'm so sorry to have heard about what happened to your boys. Thank you. It's been really difficult. I just wish I had said something sooner. Maybe all of this could have been avoided. What do you mean by that? Well, um, I had seen Craig drinking before, and I knew that it was very odd. I had tried to say something to Scott before, but he just dismissed it as boys being boys. I was beyond furious. I knew that it wasn't fair to blame Craig, but for Scott to have known that Craig had been drinking before in the past, and to not take actions to prevent him from continuing to do so, was unconscionable. As soon as we had heard this, we stormed over to speak with Scott. Scott! We just heard that you knew all about your son drinking in the past. Why didn't you warn us of this? For crying out loud, our boys are dead because of you. Scott looked down at his feet and looked like he felt very guilty, but it bought him absolutely no sympathy from us. Don't just stand there looking at your feet. Say something. I'm sorry that things went too far. That was all he said before he ran into his house and locked the door behind him. I wanted to break down the door and keep yelling at him, but Jason grabbed me and dragged me away. I knew that it was the right choice to make, but I was still furious. Over the next couple of years, we did our best to heal, but it was incredibly hard, and our marriage had a few rocky points, but we healed together, and I'm happy to say that Jason and I are in a very good place together. 
However, my anger towards Scott had never gone away. As such, I always kept an ear open to his whereabouts and what he was up to. I knew that it was a bit unhealthy, but he had become something of an obsession for me, and recently I had even felt that it was time to just let things go. But then I heard something that renewed my suspicion of him. A few months ago, I had heard that he had begun teaching baseball again. That wasn't the thing that caught my attention, but rather, there was a rumor that some of the boys that he was teaching had been caught drinking. There was something about that that made me really get invested in finding out more. There was a real possibility that he was letting more boys drink. And after what had happened to our sons, I wasn't going to let it happen to someone else's parents. To follow him around in my car and seeing where he went. Then one day I saw him pull into a liquor store and when he came out, he was carrying a case of beer. Something told me that I was onto something until I saw that his next stop was a drugstore. That made me very confused, but I didn't really know the reasoning as to why he would do that, and so I just kept following him. What I saw next really shocked me though. He went straight to the baseball diamonds, which were oddly empty. In order to not arouse suspicion, I parked far enough away that he wouldn't spot me or my car, but close enough that I could keep an eye on what he was up to. He got out of his car and grabbed the case of beer as well as the shopping bag that he had picked up at the drugstore. He then went into the changing rooms. Several minutes passed and he hadn't come out when suddenly a boy wearing a baseball uniform riding a bicycle road passed me and headed towards the changing room. He placed his bike along the wall to the changing room and went inside. I waited another 10 minutes and no other players showed up. I became concerned and drove up behind Scott's car and slowly crept into the changing room. I was not prepared to see what awaited me inside though. The baseball player was lying half naked on the floor passed out and Scott was beginning to undress. The way he was looking at the boy made my skin crawl. And feeling enraged, I ran up and kicked Scott as hard as I could in the crotch and then grabbed the boy and fled out to my car where I drove as quickly as I could home. I didn't know what else to do, but as I drove away, I saw Scott run out to his own car and give pursuit. While driving, I called my husband and told him to gather up the entire neighborhood and wait for me in our driveway. I honestly didn't have a plan but I wanted witnesses just in case Scott tried anything dangerous. As I pulled into the driveway, I checked and saw Scott pull in behind me. Before I could grab the unconscious boy from the back seat of my car, he ran up to me with his hands in the air. Wait, wait, wait. I can explain everything. Please, Emily, just calm down. There's no need to make this any worse than it already is. Oh no, I know exactly what I saw. I know exactly what you were intending to do, you monster. As if on cue, the garage door opened up behind me, and Jason, along with all of our neighbors, emerged from inside our garage. Scott drugged the boy in the back seat of my car and was planning to assault him. I got there just in time to prevent him from being able to do so. Just then, one of the older teenagers stepped forward from the crowd. He was our neighbor's eldest son, and in previous years he had Scott as a coach. It's true, and he wouldn't have been the first. I've been keeping this a secret for a long time, but I can't keep silent and let it keep happening. He even used to do it to his own son as well. Scott is a truly evil man. He used to bring beer to games and sometimes I would pass out. And when I woke up, I knew what happened, but I felt so much shame that I kept quiet. I felt sick to my stomach as I realized that that was probably what had happened to our sons. Only maybe he had given them too much of whatever it was that made them fall asleep. As soon as Jason realized this as well, his vision went red, and he screamed out in fury, and he attacked Scott. However, he wasn't alone. Everyone there attacked him as well. The mob descended on him, and I was amazed that he was even still alive when the police finally showed up. I don't know who called them, but they had arrived just in time. They managed to get everyone off of Scott, and after everyone had told them why they had attacked him, they handcuffed him and threw him into their squad car. The weeks that followed saw my husband as well as several other members of the mob that attacked Scott get basically a slap on the wrist for their part in what happened. They were given some community service hours and fined, but nothing more serious than that. Scott, however, stood trial for what he had attempted to do to that boy. As if that wasn't bad enough for him though. Once it came out that he had been arrested for trying to assault a boy, dozens of men of various ages came forward and accused him of also assaulting them. As a result, Scott was charged with dozens of counts sexually assaulting children. 
All of the charges stuck as well, and not only was his name ruined in the community, but he was sentenced to spend the rest of his life in prison. The last I heard was that he spends more time in the infirmary, though, than in his actual cell. It seems that his fellow inmates don't care for him very much and attack him constantly because of his crimes. As for Jason and I, well, we couldn't stay in that city anymore, and we have moved far away. We feel a strong amount of closure for finding out exactly what happened to our sons, and although knowing what happened won't bring them back, it is a relief to know that their killer is facing justice for what he did. Both of us wish that we had found out before he had hurt our sons, but we will just have to settle for making sure that he can never again hurt anyone else. So, put yourself in my shoes. Would you have done things differently?